Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to Facebook Live. Um, if somebody wouldn't mind in the comments letting us know you can hear us, we're both new to Facebook Live. Hi, everyone. How are you? Just make sure you can hear us. Hello. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can you hear us okay? Is the volume okay? We'll give a minute for for a confirmation. Great. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. All right. So I am Dr. Diana Bush. Um, I'm a family doctor here in Lawrenceville. And I'm Jackie Ritter, physician assistant here at Lawrenceville and Nottingham. Yeah, and we're with, of course, Capital Health Primary Care. Um, thank you for um, the comments here. If for some reason you can't hear us during the, the duration of the talk or if there's any kind of technical issues, please feel free to go ahead and comment. Also, if there are comments or questions that you have, um, feel free to comment throughout the talk and we'll do our best to answer them, either throughout or at the end. So um, I will be going over um, a few different things, uh, ticks, mosquitoes, and bee stings. And I'm going to be going over uh, several other th uh, topics. I'm going to be doing plants that can cause some itchies. Um, we're going to be doing spiders, snakes, and bears. So um, we just want to share that we're both avid outdoor people. We feel that it is crucial to um, get outside, especially with all the, the craziness going on with COVID and all the, the fear and the isolation. The more you can be outside, um, the better. We think it's good for you, kind of mind, body, and soul, so to speak. Um, so we want to encourage you to get outside, and we hope to uh, share some tips that are helpful. And first thing first is that if you are going to be doing going outside and doing anything extended, you want to try and find a couple different things that you always want to pack first before we go through the things that you want to try and avoid. Is one, having a nice lightweight backpack that seems to be able to carry a lot with pockets and things. Uh, second thing is you always want to make sure that you bring water, that you are hydrated well, because you don't want to be stuck without water. And number three is a medical kit. You never want to be outside. If you have any problems, this will really, really help you along the way with bandages, tape, uh, tweezers, instructions. So you always want to make sure that those are the essential items that you take with you, plus some of the other things that we're going to show you as well. All right, so um, I'm going to start us out with ticks. Um, because in our practice, this is the, one of the biggest topics we get a ton of questions on. There's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of confusing information, conflicting information, um, and they are, there's a ton of them in the area. We all hear about Lyme, we've all, a lot of us probably had Lyme. Um, so that's gonna be like the, the first topic um, that we spend a little bit of time on. So I'll review um, some basics on ticks, what they spread, what you can do to avoid ticks, and how to reduce your chances of getting Lyme. So ticks are found primarily in wooded and grassy areas, which would include our backyards. They particularly love an edge of a woodland or a tall brush. Thankfully, they can't jump. They wait, <laughs> horrifying thought. <laughs> um, they wait on the, um, on the brush as we brush by and they climb onto us. Um, I have heard occasionally of ticks falling from trees, but that is not the norm. <laughs> ticks can actually be around all year long. Um, especially in a milder winter, they become active when it's 40 degrees or warmer out. So it is possible to, to contract usually or uh, experience a bite from an adult tick um, even during the winter. Most cases of Lyme occur between April and October with 50% of the cases in June and July. Um, a big take home message today um, from this part of the talk is that tick borne illnesses are preventable and we do not need to fear them. This is a case where an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. When you go out, it's helpful to wear light colored and close weave clothing so that, that the ticks are visible and can't permeate through your clothing. Long sleeves are best. And please feel free to make the fashion statement of tucking your shirt into your long pants and your long pants into your socks. It goes a really long way at preventing them from getting to your skin. Um, bug sprays. There's a ton of different bug sprays on the market. The gold standard, despite its bad rap, is actually DEET. Uh, usually 10 to 30 percent, although sometimes you need sometimes a, you really need to go to the 40 percent. 40 percent max DEET. Um, depending on how high risk of an area that you're going to be going into. 
DEET is um, the most effective against ticks and also a wide variety of other um, biting insects. Also, it's, um, it works for the longest duration of time. It's been around for at least 70 years. It's been used extensively, especially in Europe. Um, when used appropriately, it is safe, um, including for children over two months and pregnant women. What you wanna do um, is first put sunscreen on. And if you have any questions about sunscreen, you can refer to the other um, talk that um, Dr. Vandergriff did for Capital uh, a couple months ago, a really good talk on sunscreen. Um, so what you want to do is put sunscreen on first and then apply enough of the deep containing bug spray to lightly cover all exposed skin and clothing. You don't need to spray skin under the clothing. Um, you want to spray it in your palms and rub your palms together and then apply to the face a, a light coating. Then you want to wash your hands. That way we don't rub it into our eyes, which can be irritating. Um, for this reason, you never want to put um, a bug spray that contains DEET on the hands or face of kids under three because it will invariably end up in their eyes and probably their mouths too. Um, permethrin is another available option that's very effective for preventing ticks, but this is for the application onto clothing only. You don't want to put this on your skin. Here's an example of what it might look like. Um, Jackie had some at home. Um, what you want to do is treat your clothing um, in a well-ventilated area by getting it all wet and then um, letting it dry, and then you can put it on. A lot of people just treat their boots, their hiking boots, um, since that's the primary way that ticks kind of crawl up, and um, that's a really nice way to limit any exposure that you have um, and kind of maximize the effect there. A third product that is widely available is called um, picaridin, which you want to get in a 20% solution. But I wouldn't really recommend this because it is not as effective as DEET for tick prevention once you've been out for an hour. DEET really is the gold standard. Um, for those of us that are a bit more holistically minded, there are a number of natural sprays that are available for purchase. They use substances like citronella, lemon lemongrass, and cedarwood. Unfortunately, a lot of these have been shown to be rather ineffective. Um, However, for a, a short and a low risk exposure, so just being outside maybe uh, for lunch in your backyard, something like that, um, they might be effective um, and appropriate there. My personal favorite for these type of situations is geranium essential oil, which um, like the flower geranium, it's very strong smelling, so you have to be like geraniums a lot. Um, you would wanna mix one third of that with two thirds almond essential oil and then you can just apply a drop to your ankles, your wrists, the back of your knees, your neck, uh, your head. And that can cut down on the number of ticks that are um, uh, um, attracted to you. I also do the same for my furry friends, although they usually get mad at me since I don't <laughs> like this thing. <laughs> there is not a lot of good data on this, however. So when you use something, um, you really want to be careful that when there's not a lot of data on it to make sure that you're, you're being very vigilant. Doing all of these things to help keep ticks off is important, but the single most important step to preventing tick-borne illnesses is tick checks every day. Um, you wanna get into the habit of it for you, your kids, and your pets. You wanna check the whole body, including the hair, behind the ears, in the ears, in the armpits, in the groin area, and even between the toes. Um, a deer tick has to be attached for a minimum of 36 hours to transmit Lyme. So if you're diligent about your tick checks, you virtually eliminate the chances of con contracting Lyme. So if you do all of this and a tick still manages to succeed in biting you, which they are good at, I will say, you wanna get a pair of tweezers with a fine point, grip it as close to the skin as you can, and pull it out in a steady and gentle motion. Uh, the other thing that actually Jackie has used is something called a tick key. And basically you can buy this at Amazon it fits in right here where the tick would attach. I can't find the spot, there we go. <laughs> and basically you pull in an opposite direction. It gives you all the instructions on it, very easy to remove, the head comes out with it, nice clean removal from the skin. So this is uh, another option that you can get. These are actually sold right on Amazon. You can buy them at Dick's Sporting Goods. Um, any of your sporting goods stores should have them. Um, you wanna make sure that you're not agitating the tick too much um, as that can increase the amount of saliva that the tick puts out, as gross as that sounds 
and that would increase the chances of, of spreading Lyme into your bloodstream. You'd want to wash that area with soap and water or alcohol after the tick is removed. Every now and then we encounter a tick that's really stuck. Um, it's the best efforts of all of us, even myself as a provider, sometimes on, I'm unable to get ticks out of people, uh, family members, but if you come into the office, um, deschedule an appointment, we have some other tools that we can use to try to remove those really stubborn ticks. Um, if, as gross as it sounds, you get the body of the tick, but the head is still in place, if it's been under 36 hours, it still reduces the risk of contracting Lyme because the Lyme, um, which is a type of spirochete or bacteria, um, is contained in the stomach, and then it moves to the salivary glands of the tick, That's w which is then when it gets um, into your bloodstream. So if it hasn't happened in high numbers yet, um, even with a, an attached head, or the hypostome, which is the, the tooth part of the tick, does still decrease your risk. So even if you've done all of this absolutely perfectly, and despite your best efforts, you still find a deer tick that may have been attached for more than 36 hours. There is still a way even to reduce the chances of getting Lyme. You can call your provider, and if appropriate, they can um, prescribe a one-time dose of doxycycline. Um, if you take it within 72 hours, it cuts down a lot on your chances of contracting Lyme. Just a note though, doxycycline can't be used in children under eight and there's really no other antibiotic um, that has been shown to do this. Um, if all that fails and you know, you're know you out on a wilderness excursion without cell service in the tick capital of, or the Lyme capital of the world, which is actually where we live, and you get a deer tick that's been attack, attached for 36 hours, your chances of getting Lyme are estimated to be as low as 3%. So um, it's really something that um, you don't need to worry worry about it, take precautions, but it's definitely not the end of the world. And the chances are still that you won't wind up getting Lyme. Um, a little bit about the biology of ticks. They have three stages that they go through. There's a larva stage, a nymph stage, and an adult stage. Ticks need a blood meal to go from the larva to the nymph stage, and from the nymph to the adult stage. The adult um, female tick also needs a blood meal um, to produce her eggs. The males don't. They're vegetarian little guys that don't bother us <laughs> at that stage of life. Um, ticks aren't born with Lyme, or, they, or, they, you know, or whatever ticks are. <laughs> I'm not sure the born is the right <laughs> word there. Um, they pick up Lyme from an infected host, uh, such as a deer, a squirrel, or a mouse. So that's why the larvae um, that's where they're, that stage is when they're contracting Lyme themselves, which doesn't affect the ticks. Um, when the tick takes its second blood, blood meal after being infected with Lyme, that's when the Lyme starts to, um, the spirochete, the bacteria Lyme, starts to reproduce. It gets passed into the animal or person it's feeding on through the saliva, like we talked about. Uh, most cases of Lyme come from the nymph stage, which are tiny. Um, I want to show you a picture from a couple of weeks ago. I was out hiking. Um, that little tiny guy is a nymph deer tick. Um, obviously not hard to see why they are so hard to find. They're also, they also tend to be active when we are um, out a lot, so like May through June area at the time, sometimes even into July. Um, the females are a little easier to see. Um, there are three, let me show you here. Here are adult female ticks. Here's the three different types of ticks that we have a lot of in New Jersey. This is the deer tick. The middle one is the lone star tick, as you can see by the, the, the lone star on its back. And this one is the um, American dog tick. We have two dog ticks that live in New Jersey. Um, the brown dog tick looks like the American one, but it's just completely brown without the white spots. So the names actually kind of help us out there. So in New Jersey, um, uh, ticks can spread a couple different things, a few different things. This is not true for the entire U.S. So if you are out in you know the, um, the west or the southeast, um, there's a lot of regional differences that you want to keep in mind. So here, obviously, we worry about Lyme the most. We see it a lot. Um, the symptoms of Lyme are basically flu-like symptoms, fevers, chills, joint aches, muscle aches, headaches, especially posterior headaches in the back of the ne neck and the head. Um, 
you can have some swollen glands in the um, in the front of the neck on both sides. Um, if you develop an erythema migraines rash, which is um, it, it's actually very helpful. I have a couple pictures here. This is the bullseye rash that we all hear about. Um, 60 to 80 percent of people with Lyme will develop the bullseye rash. Um, if you develop this in this part of the, the world, there's nothing else that that is. That is Lyme disease, and you need to be treated with, you know, a 14 to 21 day course of doxycycline or another antibiotic um, that is available. Um, erythema migraines, um, we get a lot of questions and people in the office who um, are concerned about bullseye rashes. If you're seeing just a tiny little rash around um, the bite site that's, you know, like a centimeter or so, you're just seeing the local reaction to the bite. And erythema migraines is larger. It's usually about, um, it has to be by definition, five centimeters in diameter. Um, it can start out a little sl smaller, but it's gonna slowly expand and, um, and it will become that, that big, if not a lot bigger. Sometimes there's a ring of bruising around it. Um, sometimes it's flat, sometimes it's a little bit raised, um, sometimes it's not, it's hot to the touch, sometimes it's not. There's a lot of variation. A lot of people think it's um, like a spider bite. It looks a lot similar to, to that sometimes. Um, it can be oval in shape. So if you have any doubts, um, you know, you can always schedule and we've got like telemedicine and all these things now that make it a lot easier to really see the rash. Um, here's another example of an erythema migraines, which is just kind of like a red splotch. Um, the incubation period between the bite and the, the rash there is, it can be up to a month, anywhere from a day to 32 days. Um, at the stage that people develop that rash, there's really no sense in getting blood testing done. It, only 30% of people will test positive and you already know you have Lyme. Um, more than 90% of the cases of Lyme occur in New England and the mid-Atlantic regions. So if you happen to be traveling whenever we're allowed to travel again, <laughs> when COVID <laughs> is less of a thing, um, then just bear in mind that we hear a lot of stories where people get admitted for and have all these you know, extensive workups because providers in other parts of the country may not recognize Lyme because they don't see it. Um, so just always kind of keep that in mind um, if you ever find yourself in that situation. Less commonly, but still in New Jersey, we have things called anaplasmosis and ehrlichiosis. These are um, tick-borne diseases. They travel along with Lyme. The same tick can pass them to you. They have the same symptoms as Lyme, plus nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Sometimes a little bit of a reduced appetite. We oftentimes don't ever get to the sta stage of actually diagnosing these because you're treated for Lyme and you never have the testing done um, because it's treated and it's gone. The Babesiosis is similar to the symptoms of Lyme, but also can cause a cough, a sore throat, and even um, light sensitivity or depression. Um, people can get very sick from babesiosis. It does not respond to the same treatment as Lyme disease responds to. Um, so, you know, if you are treated for Lyme and you're really not feeling better near the end of the antibiotic course, or before, if you're getting worse, you need, you need to make sure you reach out to your, to your provider. We also get what's called Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever every now and then in New Jersey. I think we've both seen cases, um, few and far between, thank goodness. Um, people get really sick. It's a severe headache, high grade fever, um, and the rash is, is pretty remarkable. It's not the kind of thing you can miss. It's a really diffuse rash. It starts on your, um, on your wrists and your ankles and, and migrates from there. So, but thankfully we don't, we don't see it often. Um, so we have a few different species. I kind of showed you the picture. Um, the deer tick is the bad guy that we watch out for because it spreads Lyme and the other two, the Ehrlichia, the Babesia, uh, not the Babesia, the, um, yes, the Babesia and the um, Anaplasmosis. So all four of the ones that we see a lot, you can get from your good old deer tick. Um, the dog ticks spread Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. So if you get bit by this guy, uh, this guy, it's not as likely that you're actually going to get sick, but just keep a, a watchful eye out. Uh, the lone star tick here in the middle um, will spread ehrlichiosis, but it also can spread something called alpha-gal or meat allergy, which is a newly diagnosed um, phenomenon in the last few years. Um, all mammals have um, 
alpha, except for people, and a few exceptions, um, have a sugar molecule called alpha gal. The lone star tick can um, can, ins can get that into your bloodstream when it bites you, and you can respond theoretically to, with an allergy, um, an allergic reaction. That can range from anywhere from like mild um, mild symptoms, a little bit of nausea, a little bit of um, like a little bit of a rash, uh, runny nose and sneezing even, all the way up to an anaphylactic reaction where you would have um, the difficulty breathing, the throat closing, the dizziness and lightheadedness. So um, that usually takes three to six hours after you eat red meat. So let's say that you're, you're bit by a lone star tick. This happens and it's, most people don't have this reaction, but it is possible. And three to six hours after you eat red meat, uh, beef, lamb, they actually, pork is included here too. Um, it, can, it has alpha gal in it as a mammal. Um, and you can develop this reaction. So keep an eye, if you have that, we can test for it in the office with a simple blood test. So that is ticks in a nutshell, potentially more than you ever wanted to know about ticks, <laughs> but it is good to know living in such an endemic area. Um, just remember Lyme is very preventable and it's very treatable and curable, especially when it's treated early. Um, so being proactive makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So what I'm gonna do is uh, talk a little bit about plants. First though, I have to send a shout out to these two little, my chickens who love to go on adventures with me. They go everywhere that I go. Uh, most of the time they take me off trail. Um, they have learned wood safety, boat safety, a little bit of everything. They've taught me things and they've also helped with this presentation. So a little shout out to my, my, little, my little ones there. So basically what I'm gonna start talking about are what everybody has been coming in with, plant dermatitis. And basically there's three plants that we have to worry about with this. We have poison ivy, down here, which is leaves of three, they're pointed. Um, we have poison oak in the center, and they're more of like an oak-shaped leaf. And then the one that's not so recognizable is poison sumac. Now, usually what happens with poison ivy and oak is that they will form either vines or shrubs, but sumac can actually form a shrub or a tree. So this is the one that's least um, recognizable by most people thinking that they're pulling things out and not even realizing that actually all three of these came, contain the same oil, which is called urushiol. And even just a small amount of this oil actually can cause us to have a horrible, itchy, blistery rash. It's very interesting because the rash appears 24 to 72 hours after contact. It does not happen immediately. And so it starts off with small blistering. It can be anywhere that the oil contacts. And some people are concerned about spread of this oil and spread of, of this reaction, thinking that you know it's spreading on different parts of the body as different time goes on. Basically what's happening is that, that urushiol is being absorbed at different rates by the body. And you did touch all those areas, but some areas are able to develop the rash much sooner than others. So it almost looks like this rash is spreading when it is not. If you're highly allergic, you'll get a horrific response. There's 15% of the population that does not respond to this oil. They do not get any reaction whatsoever. So if you're one of those lucky 15%, count yourself very lucky because this is a very annoying rash that usually uh, we see from spring through all the way through fall. And if it's a mild winter, sometimes it will even last into some of our uh, early winter months. Uh, it is found all across North America. Um, if you're camping, hiking, gardening, you will find it in any of those areas all across North America. Now there's something interesting that you can use if you are out gardening, and it's something called ivy block. It contains a chemical called bentoquatum and it's a barrier between the skin and the oil. So it actually provides a preventative barrier to try and help prevent that, that oil from penetrating the skin. But most importantly, as Diana had mentioned with ticks, the most important thing is long sleeves, long pants, gloves, so that none of your skin is exposed to this oil. Now, if at any time you think that you are exposed, basically what you wanna do is come inside, wash very well with soap and water. You don't need to use bleach. You don't need to use scrubbing agents. Uh, Water and soap is perfectly fine to get the oils off of these things. Now the other thing that a lot of people are concerned about is thinking that this rash is contagious. And that is one myth that we're gonna bust tonight. <laughs> that rash is not contagious. Even if the blisters open up, it's just oils, it's just the reaction from your skin from the oil. So I can touch that rash as long as you have washed and have no oil on your skin, and I can touch me, and I'm not gonna contract it. So I know a lot of people get worried about washing their sheets, their clothes, their towels, everything so that the family doesn't contract it. We don't even have to worry about that. It is not contagious. 
Um, definitely, if you are exposed, you want to wash your clothes very well um, so that we don't have that continued spread going back to those clothes. Now, the one site that I seem to find the most prevalence when people are out and they've been gardening and then they come back in and two weeks later they develop a rash again and again are the shoes that they're wearing because people wash the clothes but they don't think about the shoes that they're wearing. Sneakers, laces, um, gardening shoes, all will contain oil and that oil can live on surfaces for years if not cleaned off. So my advice is keeping a designated pair of garden shoes outside. You touch them with gloves, you take the gloves off uh, properly when you go and come back inside or it's a pair of shoes that you can wash regularly when you're outdoors uh, with gardening. Uh, you also wanna wash your gardening equipment down. Warm soapy water or alcohol will denature the oil. So you wanna make sure that everything is wiped down after your use, especially if you come in contact with those three plants that uh, I showed you earlier. And in terms of treatment, this rash can go from mild to extremely severe. The worst cases usually are on the face where it gets around the eyes, people get a lot of swelling, uh, if you are very highly allergic to this, uh, you can definitely develop an extensive rash, also depending upon how much you've touched. So there's different treatments that you can do. Number one over-the-counter would be an over-the-counter calamine, hydrocortisone cream, Benadryl as an antihistamine to stop the itch, cool compresses. But if it gets to the point where this rash is not going away or starts to feel more extensive, then we definitely want to have you in the office so that we can definitely start you on some prescription strength steroid creams Sometimes we have to do oral steroids and sometimes even injectable steroids to try and get this to quiet down. Um, and it can last for several weeks, unfortunately, until the body clears that histamine reaction. The other big source of oils coming into the house are those people that have those furry critters called dogs and cats. They love to get into the plants. They carry it on their fur. It does not infect their skin, but they love to infect us with it. So if they're on the couch with you, rolling on the floor with you, getting in bed with you, they're gonna spread that oil to you and you're gonna wonder where you got this because you weren't outside, but your pets are definitely the big one that um, will bring that in. So that's you know the biggest concern. Now also, you never, ever, ever wanna burn these plants. Uh, the oils can be released in the smoke. It can get into your eyes, your nose, your lungs and can cause significant reaction. And that's something that you would need to seek medical attention for urgently, most likely in an urgent care center or emergency room if you were to inhale it because then they definitely have to get you steroids to help with that, that reaction to the lungs. You never wanna burn those plants. You always wanna dispose of them properly, never burn them. So that's pretty much it. And once again, I'll put the picture up here. Let's find it again. We've got, whoop, poison ivy, poison oak, and poison sumac. Okay, do you wanna talk about? Sure, yeah. All right, so um, bees and mosquitoes, um, we'll go over a little bit here. So um, usually mosquito bites um, cause a local histamine reaction. Uh, we are allergic, a lot of people are allergic to their saliva. Um, so you have a small scale allergic reaction, um, usually just a little bit, maybe an inch or so around the bite site. Um, however, some people can have what's called a large local reaction. Um, where the whole, you'll have up to like a 10 centimeter patch of just swollen, um, swollen skin there. Um, worldwide, mosquitoes are actually the most dangerous animal. I know we've all heard that because of what they spread. <laughs> but here in New Jersey, thankfully, because of our, you know, our winters and, and everything else, um, we don't see a lot of mosquito-borne disease. Uh, we do see um, an occasional West Nile case um, still which is when uh, it's spread, it spread when a mosquito contracts it from an infected bird and then spreads it back to, to us with its next blood meal. Um, bees, wasps, and some yellow jacket sting, uh, uh, singers actually have uh, barbs on them um, that stay in the skin and a venom sac. So when you get bit by one of those guys, it's a different kind of thing. Um, you can get a little bit of the allergic reaction, but we also tend to react to the venom, which is why it's so painful when we get stung. The venom actually takes a few seconds to release once it's, the stinger is in your arm. So if you are bitten by one of these guys, you just wanna flick it off as fast as you can because if you get it within a few seconds, that venom doesn't even get uh, released. If, um, if it's been a little longer than that and you get the pain and everything, um, you wanna try to neutralize the acid um, as, or the, the venom as best you can. There's, there's not a whole lot of good ways to do that. 
Um, a lot of people swear by meat tenderizer. Yeah, <laughs> which, which we have. Which we have. <laughs> Good old meat tenderizer. Basically what you do is in a small bowl, just a little bit of water, pour in some of this, make a little paste, apply it to that sting. It will help to neutralize that uh, that venom in there and actually quiet things down for you so that you can try and get the stinger out um, and be a little more comfortable than, uh, you know, just trying to, to handle that, that sting on, on your own. Uh, toothpaste also is supposed mm -hmm. to work. Um, none of this is really evidence-based, but there's a lot of really good um, anecdotal ev evidence to show us that there's some effect. Um, oh, yes, yes. And we have, um, they sell benzocaine, which is um, basically a number that can help for a while. You kind of break open one of the little um, glass containers in it, and you can rub it on um, the sting site. You can also um, use some hydrocortisone, which is an over-the-counter um, cream that actually has the best efficacy when you look at the data for uh, reducing the pain and the swelling. Um, you can also use um, Benadryl. Benadryl is your friend in a lot of these different things. Um, it causes drowsiness, and you can't use it in children under two, um, but it, it does help with a lot of, of the histamine-driven reactions here. Um, you can also use a non-drowsy histamine like Claritin or Zyrtec, um, Allegra, Zizol. There's a bunch of them out there. The generics work just as well. Um, and actually, interestingly, you can add on Pepsid for heartburn, or Famotidine is the drug name. Um, that actually works. There's a little bit of cross-reaction with the histamine receptors, so we can actually take advantage of that, the non-specific action of that drug a little bit to really help, um, help with the rashes. Um, so some re reactions, while they're small and, you know, or just localized, some people have more of a systemic reaction or the large, um, the large reactions that are up and down the arm, you may want to schedule an appointment because there are prescription strength mm -hmm. um, steroids that we can put you on, the creams, and sometimes people even need an oral um, prednisone or something like that to, to help. Um, we also see, of course, anaphylactic reactions, which is a life-threatening uh, reaction to bee stings, uh, where people would need to carry an EpiPen. Um, so any bites can cause this kind of reaction. Um, they can also cause a secondary um, infection with bacteria called cellulitis. Sometimes it can be hard to tell the difference between a cellulitis and just a, a really bad reaction. So sometimes, you know, you need to get that checked out. It can be even challenging for us to tell sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, you really want to pay attention to what's happening if your um, reaction is starting to get better and then it starts to get red, hot, swollen, painful. That could be a sign of an infection. So you would really want to get that checked out. Um, yeah, so that's bees and... Uh, and, and the other thing is that um, your honeybees will sting once. They lose their stinger and they die. So they will leave a stinger behind. Yellow jackets, hornets, they will sting multiple times. So yeah. if you get one up a pant leg, you get one trapped in your clothes, it will sting you multiple times. And that's when you have to worry about those anaphylactic reactions because it's such a large amount of venom that's actually entering this, the, the, you know, the body. So if we have that case where you've never been allergic before, but all of a sudden have a multiple sting from one of these bees, you do need to watch a little more closely for that reaction because they do keep their stinger and they will continue to sting until they can get away out of the body or they get killed by you hitting them. <laughs> um, I unfortunately hit ground bees one time. They got into my clothes. I was mowing the lawn. Um, I got bit multiple, multiple times uh, and stung multiple times all over. They got into my clothing. Uh, it was not fun. Um, when I was young, I also stepped on a crab apple in nursery school and got my pant leg and stung me nine times. So. Those are the type of reactions that you really worry about and you have to watch a little more closely for uh, because of the amount of, of venom that they are spreading. So that's, that's bees and mosquitoes <laughs> and things in a nutshell. So I'm going to talk about another critter that likes to bite. Um, thank God we don't have many of them in New Jersey. And those are your spiders. And in New Jersey we have four poisonous spiders. You would think that all of them, you know, have to you know, be poisonous, but we only truly have four, and there's two that are a major concern. Uh, the other two, not so much. So the two that we worry about the most, and I'll show you some pictures, are your black widow and your brown recluse spider. But the other two that can bite and cause some skin damage and some skin tissue irritation is a wolf spider and a yellow sack spider. So let me show you some pictures of those so that you can kind of get acquainted with what these critters really look like. Now first, these are some of our spiders in New Jersey. The top ones are your highly venomous, 
And as you know, when you're outdoors, you can see tons of different spiders. This is only a small smattering of, of our spiders here in New Jersey. They all look different. They all you know, do make different webs. But the ones that we're going to talk about are the four that I had mentioned about being highly venomous, especially the black widow and the brown recluse, because those are the most dangerous. So here we have a picture of your black widow on this side. I'm backwards, sorry. And on this side, your brown recluse. Both of them highly, highly dangerous. Of course, your black widow is a very telltale sign, and I'll show a better picture. It has a red hourglass shape on it. You cannot miss this guy. This guy is definitely uh, noticeable because of his color with the black and the red. The brown recluse on this side is a little bit more sneaky because he likes to hide out in mulch piles, in old wood piles, in your sheds, in your attics, in your garages, and he blends in with the surfaces there. So unfortunately, this guy is a little bit more uh, concerning because he will bite you. This guy you know you'll, you'll definitely notice and hopefully get away from. Here's another picture of uh, a black widow. Again, that hourglass shape, you really can't miss it. It's very characteristic for this spider. And so, uh, again, now the interesting thing with this guy is he likes to make his nests, uh, his, his webs, very low to the ground. And they're actually a very thick web-like structure. You actually, if you break that web, it snaps. They're very, very thick silk threads. So that's a difference. So if you see a thread that's closer to the ground or in corners, and you see something like this, and, it's, and it, it makes some noise, you've got to worry that you've got a black widow sitting there somewhere uh, in that area. So just a word of caution, they, they, do net, they do build their webs a little bit differently. Um, in terms of a black widow bite, they start off sometimes like this, with just two little fang marks, nice and, and inconspicuous. You don't sometimes even notice that it happens. Some of them are painful, some of them are not. And as time goes on, this will get more red, more swollen, more painful, more irritated, and start to form red areas, may start to form a dark center, which is called a necro necrotic center, where the tissue actually dies off. And these are things that you have to worry about where you need to seek medical attention immediately. We don't play around with these type of spider bites. They're very, very different looking um, because of how dangerous they can become. Unfortunately, your brown recluse bites are, look even worse. Um, this is one that has blistered, and basically what it does is it forms that blister in the center. It turns uh, to that brownish color. The skin starts to die off again, necrotic center. Has to be seen in emergency rooms so that they can treat this appropriately before this, this wound becomes uh, horribly infected and cellulitis develops, and this can be really, really dangerous. So that's usually what a brown recluse bite looks like. Um, again, these are the ones we worry about because they're in so many of our areas that we commonly clean out in the fall or in the spring, and we can find them and they blend in with those wooded areas very, very easily. Two of our other spiders that we have in New Jersey that can definitely um, irritate you are the wolf spider. And this is actually my picture. Um, I photograph uh, nature. Um, I find all the creepy crawlies and the unique things. Uh, so he is a large spider. He was probably about two inches long. He's very hairy. He's very creepy looking. They almost look like tarantulas. Um, but he can definitely take a bite out of you. Not cause as much tissue damage, but he is uh, definitely one to, to look out for. But you will notice him because he's big. So he stands out in the crowd. The one that we don't know as much of is the yellow sack spider. Now, he is also venomous, but basically he's nocturnal. So you will find him only at night. He is not out during the day. His bite is painful. And sometimes it will get that necrotic area, that dead center, sort of like the brown recluse, but not as bad. It'll be less soreness some itching, some swelling, but again, he can bite and uh, can do some damage just as the wolf spider can. But again, these two, not as bad as your black widow and your uh, brown recluse. Those are the ones that we're really concerned about and that you need to seek urgent medical attention for. So moving right along, let me move my spiders out of the way. That was not my favorite part of the talk. <laughs> <laughs> Is the next part. Snakes! <laughs> Snakes, everybody loves snakes. Not really. Um, it's interesting because there was a lot that I didn't know about how many snakes we had in New Jersey. And so basically we have officially 22 different varieties of snakes in New Jersey. Um, out of that 22, only two, thank God, are venomous. Um, the others are harmless. They will bite. They will not hurt you. Um, I mean, they could hurt you, but not in terms of causing uh, anything more substantial than a bite. And I've got some pictures to show you of one that I ran into um, back in the spring uh, when I was hiking, or maybe the fall last year. 
Um, basically what we have are, this is the one that I ran into, and he is called a black racer snake. He surprised me because I was walking in the Sourland Mountains, uh, just south of Hillsboro, and I was walking through some rocky areas looking for snakes to make sure because it was a, it was, there were no greens and things out because it was, you know, cool out, it was chilly. Walked into a wooded, woodland area where it was an open field that would go up the mountain, and I took a step, and this guy was right next to my ankle. So I took a step back. Of course, silly me pulling out my camera, decided to take some pictures of him. Do as I say, not as I do. Um, definitely, you know, I have a zoom lens so I can get close. Um, I'm a little more adventuresome, so yes, I did take a picture of him. He actually turned out to be about seven feet long. He was one of the biggest black racers that we've seen. Um, he probably was somebody's pet that they let go. Um, or he just really had a good, hefty meal, and uh, he's been doing really well out in the wild. So he was quite large. I was very surprised to run into a snake that large um, in an open area, not even in the rocks, but he was wide open in the grassland area. The other ones that you're going to encounter are your garter snake. This is your most common snake in New Jersey. Um, you'll find him in your backyards. You'll find him in your sheds. You'll find them basically in your garages. They're the ones that creep everybody out because they're out there. They're harmless. They don't do much. They're just there, they're a nuisance. But the garter snake is the one that you will find most commonly um, around residences. The other one that I thought was kind of interesting, and the colors of these snakes are absolutely beautiful in some of them, but this one you would think would be dangerous, but it's not, it's our corn snake. Corn snakes live in the Pine Barrens, but corn snakes are actually on our endangered species list. So we never wanna harm them, we wanna just keep out of their way, let them do their thing. Um, but again, you know, the color doesn't always mean that they are poisonous. Again, he can bite, but he's not gonna harm you but we definitely want to try and preserve this guy so that he uh, doesn't wind up completely extinct. The other one that we see around water a lot of times when you're out hiking around water, marshes, bogs, streams, rivers, is our northern water snake. He's a hefty little guy, and sometimes he gets confused actually with one of our dangerous ones, which is the uh, copperhead, northern copperhead snake. And so um, you'll see him around more water areas. He doesn't usually like any of the other um, rocky areas. He will like the water. That's where usually where you'll see them. I recently ran into one of these guys when I was hiking with my girls in Princeton up at Mountain uh, Lake Preserve. He was in by the water there. Couldn't capture a picture of him quick enough. The venomous ones that you worry about. Now these are the ones that we are very concerned. Okay, this one is our northern copperhead. He is venomous. He is called copperhead because of the colors on his body. He is definitely copper colored. He has darker colors with him as well. And basically his head is solid copper. His body can vary in different colors, but his head is solid copper. So you will be able to tell this guy from a lot of the other ones. Again, he does get con confused sometimes with the northern water snake. I'm not seeing the difference of it too much, but I haven't compared them two side to side and I don't really care to. <laughs> um, so no one has died in New Jersey from this snake. The bite will be very, very bad. It will cause pain, swelling, tissue damage, but nobody has died from this guy in, the, in the New Jersey that we know of at this point. He is found from the Sourland Mountains, which is Mercer, Somerset, Hunterdon County, all the way up to North Jersey. That's where this guy is found. So you really have to be careful in this area if you're out hiking. This one you may run into um, and just be very, very cautious with him. Leave him alone. People say they apparently smell like cucumbers. Not that you can <laughs> count on that. That would be interesting. And this is another picture of one. You can tell by the coloring. He is very unique. It's not something you'll mess with. But again, if he's out in the woods and, you know, he's kind of blending in with some of the leaves, you do have to be very careful with him because uh, he can hide out and kind of surprise you. Um, this is the one we have to worry about. Timber rattlesnake. Okay. He is found actually in North Jersey, in rocky uh, steep slope areas, and also in South Jersey in the Pinelands. He has a black colored tail, and I'm gonna show you a picture of it after this, that rattles. So he is the only one that rattles and makes noise. He is extremely highly venomous, and for treatment for this is that you have to seek anti-venom in the emergency room. It's not something you can mess around with. So he definitely is one that you do not want to wait. You wanna to get to your closest treatment center immediately if you think that you've been bit by the rattlesnake, okay? And that's true for any rattlesnake actually across the country. This is a better picture of him, and as you can see, uh, there it is. Here's his rattler, okay, he's got a black tail. The other thing that's very distinguishable in these pictures, and of course I can't seem to do this backwards, is his head. His head is much flatter than his body. It's much wider than the body. So you'll notice a wide flat head with the rattle there, and that's the concern for your uh, rattlesnake. And timber rattlesnake, 
get treatment immediately. Okay. So those are snakes in a nutshell, some which I haven't come encountered with, some that I hope to never see out on my pathways out in the woods. And uh, one of the last topics that we're going to talk about are bears. Now, bears are in every county in New Jersey. All 21 counties have had bear sightings. And uh, they are always black bears in this area. If, of course, you travel to other parts of the country, there's going to be other types of bears. So this is only for New Jersey here that we're talking about. Out west of grizzly bears, they are a whole different species, whole different talk. Um, they tend to be very wary of people. So people think that, you know, they get concerned that a bear is going to chase them. They're actually very scared of humans. They will grunt, they will snort, they will make noises to let their presence be known. You never feed black bears. It is illegal in New Jersey. You can be fined up to $1,000 for each time that you are caught feeding bears. Most important thing, especially for homeowners, is keeping your trash safe and out of the way of bears because they love to scourge, just hit the garbage cans, you know, get into them. Bear sense, as Dr. Dash had mentioned to me today, a bear can smell 300 times better than a human can. So they will pick up on scents that you and I will not smell, and they will hunt it out and they will find it, whether it be in your car, whether it be in your house, whether it be in your trash can. So you need to keep your house secure, you need to keep your car secure, because they will climb in and they will get to it. If you are camping, you need to keep your food source away from your tent, because if a bear does come, you do not want them coming into the tent and disrupting your whole camping trip. A lot of times you'll see people that will put um, ropes with bags of food up high up in the air. The problem is that bear can climb that tree and get to it. So you still have to be careful, but that is a safer way. But you definitely want your food source far away from an, an airtight container, like a really good thermos container or a, a icebox container that is airtight that really they can't get to the smell of that, but nowhere near you. Um, you always want to keep your uh, campsite clean if you're camping. Uh, if you hike during the daylight hours, you definitely want to look for some markings. Um, bears basically are most active early morning and late afternoons. Um, so you want to try and avoid those times, you know, unless you want to run into a bear possibly on the trail. You always want to keep small children close, especially with hiking. Hiking with dogs is dangerous sometimes because they will, they will uh, threaten a bear. Um, so you just have to be careful with that. You never want to look a bear directly in the eyes. You always want to look away. Um, you want to, you know, stay where you are. You never want to run from a bear if he is in your sight. You definitely want to back away slowly. Never run from him. And females, bears, will weigh between 90 and 180 pounds. But if you come and cross a male black bear, he can be anywhere from 130 to 660 pounds. That is a big guy. Now, the one thing that's also important is that if a bear rears up, basically it is not approaching to attack you. What it's trying to do is smell. So it tries to find its smell. So if you see a bear coming up on its hind legs, at least a black bear, most of the time that is not meaning that it's going to approach you unless you do something to trigger this. Throw some at them, do something. But if you come in contact with a bear, you make loud noises, you clap, you scream, you yell, you shout, you clap hands together if you're camping to scare them away. They don't like people, and you never want to bother a mother with her cubs. She will get vicious. So you always want to be careful of that. Um, some of the interesting things that I do when I'm camping, I mean when I'm hiking, I always, always, always carry ooh, bear spray. It is uh, like a pepper spray, but it's highly concentrated and it shoots quite far. So this is something that's always great to have, not only for the four-legged creatures, but some of the two-legged people that you might meet on a trail too that <laughs> you may not want there. Always, 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 I carry this with me everywhere that my girls and I go so that it's with us at all times, just in case we encounter a wild animal or a bear especially. But the other interesting thing is um, when my girls and I hike in the fall and especially in the spring, um, bears do not go into true hibernation in New Jersey. They go into something called torpor, T-O-R-P-O-R. -O Basically what it is is a lowered metabolic state. Their heart rate goes down, their temperature goes down, their breathing goes down. They're aware of their surroundings, but they do not feed at that time. But they never truly hibernate in New Jersey. And when we have mild winters, they definitely come out of that torpor much earlier so that they can go and then start to feed. The interesting thing that you will find on some of your trails, and this was very surprising to me, is on one part of a tree, and it's not on both sides, they will scratch the trees. Now these are ash trees, so these may already be have ash borers in them which kill the ash. But basically what this was when I came across this was fresh scrapings. You find all of the scrapings at the bottom at the base of the tree from them clawing at the tree. Sometimes a little bit further up when they try and climb up the tree. It's always on one side of the tree though. Um, Dr. Dash can attest to that as a Boy Scout leader. Um, for many, many years, he has seen this. It's a bear marking its territory. 
um, and some of these will come out very early. And if you see this and it's fresh and you can tell that it's fresh wood, you've got to be very, very cautious that that bear has been there recently. This one's a little bit older, has some older markings to it. And uh, again, like I said, you know, you'll see the scrapings on the ground. Sometimes you'll even see what we call bear scat, which is bear poop, a big pile right at the bottom. That bear will scratch its back, scratch its back, and decide to use the bathroom at the same time. So sometimes you'll see this with bear scat on the ground. It's a very large pile. Then you know that bear has been there. Some of them are old from, you know, the season prior. But these are the concerning things that we have, you know, with bears. And especially since they don't go into a full hibernation in New Jersey, we always have to be cautious of them, you know, at all times. So it's very important. Um, I think that kind of yeah, that wraps up everything. The only other thing that you might come encounter with, and the one thing that we, I've been noticing recently on our Facebook post here in Mercer County, we uh, in Lawrence Township actually, we have a coyote that is making its presence known mm -hmm. across the county. And so you just want to be very cautious to that. Red fox are also out, but they usually are very scared of people. They will screech very loud when they're mating, so people get concerned about that. Um, they usually do not um, you know, harm us. But again, coyotes you have to be careful of because they will take chickens, they will take small dogs, they will take things out of your yard um, that you do not want to lose. So you just have to be very cautious uh, that we do have wild coyote that will venture out um, you know, from coming down from the mountains. The other thing you might encounter are raccoons. And raccoons are usually nocturnal animals. They love to get into trash cans. Um, sometimes they will be out in the day as long as they are acting normal, looking normal, not foaming at the mouth. They're usually harmless. Um, so a lot of people get concerned when foxes and raccoons are out during the day, but usually not trouble. The problem is when mom gets taken by local animal control and leaves babies behind. So of course everybody calls me like Steve Irwin or Jack Hanna of Lawrence Township because everybody calls me to rescue their animals. But this was me rescuing raccoons. I don't advise it, but I, I had enough prep protection and gear on. Uh, these little guys were raised in my house with my girls for just a, a weekend until we could get them to the animal control, um, I mean, to the animal rehabilitation center. Uh, here in Mercer County and right on the border of Hunterdon County on Route 27 is a fabulous wildlife rehabilitation center. They will take any wildlife animal, turtles, birds, skunks, raccoons, snakes, anything, um, and they will try and rehabilitate them to the best of their ability and also let them go. There is also a nice little area on the weekends that is open. I don't know right now with COVID going on but they have a lot of animals that have been injured that cannot be rehabilitated to go back into the wild that they're using as educational pet, uh, and educational uh, animals. And they're uh, listed in, they've got a walk around area outside, they've got a bald eagle, they have owls, um, they have turkey vultures, they've got a lot of interesting creatures that they unfortunately could not rehabilitate. And uh, now they use them for education. So when our schools were open, they were taking them to schools and being able to show the, uh, the children some of those animals. So if you ever come across you know, something that you feel you safely can get there, that is where you definitely want to take them. All right. So I think that's everything that we wanted to, to discuss tonight. I don't know if anybody has any questions or concerns, um, any other topics that you would like us to discuss at a later date, please mention on there uh, so that we can see you know, what interests are and uh, then kind of go from there. Thank you for watching. We hope it was helpful. Yes, thank you so much, everybody. And be safe out there. Have a great night. Good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>